Well, hello, everybody, and, and welcome. I'm Anna Harvey. I'm the president of the Social Science Research Council. Um, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here today to our first centennial lecture celebrating the founding of the Social Science Research Council 100 years ago. And we're also celebrating the achievements of the social and behavioral sciences over the last 100 years. The scientists who came together to form the council in 1923 were motivated by an aspiration. They wanted to be able to provide reliable evidence to policymakers about programs and policies that would help make our societies work better for more people. And in order to do that, they wanted to focus the attention and the effort of the research community on producing solutions to pressing societal problems. And they wanted insights and innovations to flow across the disciplines. And so they came together from seven disciplinary associations to create the Social Science Research Council representing anthropology, economics, history, political science, psychology, sociology, and statistics. And for 100 years, the council has identified important social problems and mobilized the research community across disciplines to search for solutions to those problems. All throughout this year, our centennial year, we are going to be celebrating the achievements of the social and, safe, social and behavioral science research community. We've invited faculty from the institutions in our college and university fund for the social sciences, which is a network that works with the council to support social and behavioral science, to talk about the frontier of research on 10 important policy issues that represent the last 100 years of the council's work. And we're starting with immigration, which was the subject of the council's very first research initiative. Only two years before the council's founding, the United States had enacted restrictive national origin quotas on immigration without any guidance about the likely effects of those policies. In May 1924, the council appointed a committee on human migration chaired by Edith Abbott, who was the dean of the School of Social Work at the University of Chicago. And the committee worked with faculty and researchers across institutions to pull together migration and census data. And they found some evidence that was contradictory to popular misconceptions, including the widespread concern that immigration reduced literacy levels. In fact, children of immigrants had higher literacy rates than children of native born citizens. Now in the last 100 years, social and behavioral scientists have made substantial progress in understanding the many beneficial economic and social effects of immigration. We are very fortunate to have with us today, Leah Bustan, professor of economics at Princeton University, who's one of the most highly acclaimed researchers working on the subject of immigration today. Leah recently published a best-selling book, Streets of Gold, America's Untold Story of Immigrant Success. And she's here today to share with us the findings from her work. So we're very excited to be able to welcome her. And Leah, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be included in the centennial celebration of the Social Science Research Council and indeed to be the kickoff speaker. As Anna was alluding to, my lecture will be on immigration today, which was a topic of great policy relevance in the 1920s in the first decade of the council's founding. And it is of enduring relevance today. So I wanna thank Anna for the invitation to speak and to all of you for tuning in at the end of what's been a really busy week um, at the beginning of many people's semesters. I will use my time to share with you some findings from our new book, Streets of Gold, which is the culmination of more than a decade of research with my longtime collaborator, Ron Abramitsky at Stanford, and a number of our co-authors. Our motivation for writing the book is much like the motivation of the SSRC's original founding, Namely, that we felt like our national conversation on immigration and immigration policy was focused on myths and anecdotes and has not been informed enough by the data and the facts. 
one of these myths is in what inspired our title, Streets of Gold, which is the idea that anyone can move to America with just a few dollars in their pocket and they can make it here very quickly. The truth, though, may be far more complex. So consider this quotation, which is painted on the wall of the Ellis Island Museum. Um, those of you who have visited may, oh, um, start slideshow. It's still in PowerPoint view. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, on my end, I can see in full screen. Is that not what people are seeing? Are people seeing full screen right now? Um, just so I'll keep going, but um, yeah, Leah, it looks great. Okay, you know what? I just got like a a Zoom crash, um, so that must be what was going on. I'm sorry, I must have frozen at a certain place. Um, so I'm going to continue. Um, I. So if you've been to the Ellis Island Museum, you may have seen this famous quotation um, by, that's attributed to an unnamed Italian immigrant um, who said, I came to America because I heard that the streets were paved with gold. But when I got here, I found out three things. First, the streets were not paved with gold. Second, they weren't paved at all. And third, I was expected to pave them. So our question was, how would our understanding of the history of immigration to the US be different if we listened to these millions of unnamed immigrants and heard their stories rather than building up our history from the few anecdotes of immigrants who make it to the front pages of the newspaper, either because they've made great contributions in science or in culture, or because they've committed a heinous crime and they make it to the front pages. So what would happen if instead um, we were building up our understanding of immigration history from millions of individual immigrant families? In order to do this, um, we needed to build big data sets, both for today and for the past, um, so that we could get clues about why immigrants choose to come to the US, when they left school, how well they speak English, what sorts of occupations they held over the course of their working lives, who they married, what names they gave to their kids, and how their kids themselves fared in the next generation. In order to do this um, in the modern period, um, we um, thank the uh, Opportunity Insights Lab at Harvard University um, that provided data to us uh, with the underlying source being the uh, tax records from the IRS. When you file taxes uh, and you have children living at home, you report your children as tax dependents and write down their social security number. Then later on, when the children grow up and enter the labor market themselves, um, they will file tax returns with the same social security number. And that will allow the folks at the Opportunity Insights Lab and then us to create these parent-child pairs um, where we can look at the children of immigrants and the children of the US born and follow these families over time. In the historical time period, the period of Ellis Island, um, we are building up this data from underlying historical census records. In order to do this, you can think of us like curious grandchildren that go to genealogy websites like Ancestry.com and search for our own family members, but do this millions of times over. In fact, that's how we started our research process, is we went to Ancestry.com over 10 years ago and started to look up a few families. And we realized that we could do this for a few hundred families and then a few thousand families, and eventually did um, so much searching on Ancestry that Ron got a cease and desist call from the Ancestry lawyers saying, Mr. Abramitsky, it looks like you have a really big family. These days, 
Ancestry has research partnership that's brokered by the Minnesota Population Center. And um, that partnership allows scholars from many disciplines to use the underlying digitized historical census records. Um, the records will look very much like this underlying manuscript form um, that you can see on the screen um, with individual rows for each person grouped into households. Um, what we've added to this process is a set of algorithms that allow us and others to follow individuals across census waves so that you can follow an individual immigrant um, who's recently arrived in the US across multiple census periods um, to watch where he moves, what his occupational structure looks like over the course of his career, who he marries and so on. And we can also follow the children that we see in these households forward into the labor market as well. The image that I'm showing you here was not selected at random. Um, this is a census manuscript for my own family um, with my great grandfather, Hyman Platt, living in Chicago in 1920 with his wife, Annie, and their eight children. Um, if you scrolled over to the right on this image, you would see the occupations of each one of these household members. And if you follow Hyman across census periods, you'll see that he, the first generation immigrant who himself moved to the US, never moved up the occupational ladder. He remained a proprietor of a small store, essentially a small mom and pop that um, really was um, on a day-to-day -day basis, having kids go out and try to find um, goods to buy cheaply and sell for a few extra pennies in the store. But his children, the second generation, the children of immigrants did move up the occupational ladder. Um, his older kids moved into lower level white collar positions and his younger kids, my grandfather and his younger brother moved into the professions. So I'm bringing this up, not because my family is particularly interesting, but because my family represents the larger pattern that we see in the data, both in the past and today. Namely, that the first generation immigrants themselves move up slowly, both now and 100 years ago in the Ellis Island era. But it's the second generation, the children of immigrants, who are experiencing rapid economic success. So with this data in hand, we're able to reassess common immigration myths that animate much of our political discussions about immigration today. And what I want to do um, for the rest of my time um, is reassess four of these myths with you. Um, and you'll see that despite the fact that these ideas are very common in the political debate, the evidence does not support these common misperceptions. So is it really true that we're in the midst of an unprecedented flood of immigration today relative to the past? And the answer is no. Did the Ellis Island generation rise quickly, whereas immigrants today are not as successful at moving up the ladder? We've already seen in the case of my great-grandfather, that's not true. And then I'll show you what the patterns look like when we look at millions of observations. These days, immigrants come from all around the world, including some very poor sending countries. Um, so there's a common belief or at least concern that the children of immigrants will remain stuck in a permanent underclass in the US today. And I'll show you that that's not true either. And finally, I think this is the myth that I was most surprised to find uh, did not fit the data. Immigrants today are no slower at trying to become American and engaging in a process of cultural assimilation. Um, I, I, I sort of had the impression that these days it was more acceptable to hold multiple identities, to be both American and to hold um, many of the um, behaviors and practices and beliefs and norms from the home country as well. Um, but we see from as many different ways as we can measure cultural assimilation that immigrants are assimilating today as rapidly as they did in the past. And then I'll end by posing this question. If the news is so positive, if we see such remarkable immigrant success today, 
why has it been so hard to pass immigration reform? Why have we not been able to engage in legislative reform for uh, over 30 years? Okay, so let's dive in with the first myth. This myth is the easiest to dispel. It does not require big data. It simply requires long-term perspective. Um, so this is a graph that any of you can make with publicly available census data, um, just looking at the variable um, of place of birth. Um, that question was asked going as far back as 1850 and forward to today. Um, and so what I'm doing is graphing out the share of the US population that's foreign born. Um, and today that share has reached 14%. If you ask Americans on surveys, they'll tell you that the rate of immigration today is higher than ever before, but they're wrong. You can see that there was a period 100 years ago um, that during the Ellis Island generation when the share foreign born was 14% for over 50 years. In between these two high points of mass migration, you see what we call the immigration valley um, with the low point uh, share foreign born, bottoming out at 4% in 1970. This was not um, due to underlying economic incentives, but really was policy driven, like Anna alluded to, a series of restrictive pieces of immigration legislation in 1917, 1921, 1924, effectively closed the border to European immigration. Um, uh, and so we see the mid part of the 20th century as a low point of immigration. So the share foreign born is very common between uh, recent years and a century ago. But beyond that, there are many differences between these two waves of mass migration. First of all, the economic context is very different. Uh, the economy 100 years ago was heavily agricultural and engaged in manufacturing. And today the economy is, has many more services. The immigrants themselves are also very different. Um, so here we're looking at the same peak um, of mass migration uh, over 150 years, just breaking down the immigrant share into three groups. The red group represents the Americas, the yellow group represents Europe, and the blue group represents Asia. And you can see that 100 years ago, 90% of immigrants came from Europe. And today, immigrants come from a much more diverse set of sending countries. In addition, sending countries in relative terms are poorer today relative to the US than they were 100 years ago. And finally, the legal regime is very different. Though the border reopened to immigration in 1965, it did so in a very limited fashion. And so there are fewer quota slots now for entry than there is demand for entering the US. And these days, a quarter of the immigrants that you see on the right-hand side of this picture are living in the US without documents. They are undocumented immigrants. So given these many differences between past and present, there's no reason to expect that the pace of immigrant economic assimilation or cultural assimilation would be the same in these two eras. And yet, what we find is far more similarity than difference. So let's turn to the second myth, the idea that the Ellis Island generation rose quickly from rags to riches. And often, this myth is put forward in a comparative sense to say immigrants in the past moved up quickly, and immigrants today are moving up far more slowly. So let's take a look at the evidence on this slide for the historical period. Um, and what we can see, and I'll walk you through it, is that there's two ways in which this common myth is wrong. The first is that many immigrants from Europe 100 years ago did not arrive in the US in rags. They arrived already earning more than the US born and bringing with them many important job skills. The second way in which this myth is wrong is that for those immigrants who did arrive poor, they did not move up even to parity with the US born in their own lifetime. So if we take a look at the right-hand side of this picture, we can see that many immigrants 100 years ago did not arrive in rags. 
what do we mean? So the zero line here would reflect earnings parity with workers who are US born of a similar age. Any bar that's above the zero line means that immigrants are earning more than the US born. And the black bars reflect immigrants who are recent arrivals. The white bars follow the same immigrants to the end of their working career. You can see that there are immigrants from many sending countries, especially those in Western Europe, um, that arrived in the US already earning more than the US born, already um, when those immigrants had arrived within just the past five years. But there are a set of sending countries where on average, immigrants arrived earning a lot less than the US born. And you can see that group over here on the left-hand side of the picture. But these poor arrivals did not move from rags to riches in one generation. So for example, the Norwegian immigrants all the way on the left-hand side of the picture started out with an earnings gap of $4,000 in today's dollars um, and closed the gap by the end of their working life such that they ended with a $3,000 gap. Um, the pace of upward mobility is very similar between the past and the present. Um, and so there is not a, a sort of golden age or nostalgic period of immigration 100 years ago where immigrants somehow were more able to make it and that today immigrants are lagging behind. So let's turn to the third myth, which is about the children of immigrants. The concern these days is that immigrant families, not just the immigrant parents, but their children will get stuck in a permanent underclass. This concern comes up particularly because immigrants today come from a poorer set of sending countries. And as we've just argued, the first generation never moved up quickly, neither 100 years ago nor now. So the concern is maybe the children will also remain behind. What we find is really quite the opposite. First, the children of immigrants have remarkable social mobility, and I'll show you that in the next two slides. Second, the pace of upward mobility is strikingly similar between past and present. And third, this is true even for groups um, whose parents came from very poor sending countries. So I'm going to show you evidence today for children who were all raised at the 25th percentile of the US income distribution when they were in childhood. Um, but the pattern is very similar if we look at any point below the median and even a little bit above the median um, where we're going to find rapid social mobility for the children of immigrants. Okay, so now we're looking at the adult earnings of children whose parents came from uh, one of these possible sending countries represented by the different peach dots um, on the slide. And all of these groups are compared to the children of white US born parents who were also raised at the 25th percentile. Notice that all of these kids are moving up. If you're born and raised in a household at the 25th percentile, it's not that you're doomed to yourself live at the 25th percentile in adulthood. Um, if you look at the x-axis, you can see that it ranges between 45th percentile and 70th. So all of these children are moving up. However, the children of immigrants are moving up faster than even the children of white US born um, for almost every ascending country. This pattern I'm showing you on the slide represents immigrant sons. I've said immigrant children, but I'm showing you here just the pattern for immigrant sons. If I showed you the pattern for daughters, it would look very similar. Um, and I do want to highlight that the three country groups um, that are somewhat below the white US born, um, the sons of immigrants from Haiti, Jamaica, and Trinidad and, and Tobago, that pattern looks quite different when you're looking at immigrant daughters. The daughters of immigrants from those three countries are actually right in the middle of the daughter image. But sticking with sons, and I do this simply so we can compare past and present, you can pick out a whole uh, set of very interesting countries um, in terms of the, the current policy debates. If you think about um, the children of immigrants from Guatemala, El Salvador, and Nicaragua in the middle part of this image, those are three Central American countries um, that have been um, enmeshed in this discussion of quote unquote crisis at the southern border. And here we're looking at the children of immigrants from those countries um, these are poor sending countries. And we know here that the households raise their kids at the 25th percentile. 
yet the kids uh, from these households are on average reaching the 53rd percentile in adulthood. Um, and so um, what makes this uh, pattern even mo more powerful, I think, is to compare to the next slide, where we can see a very similar uh, set of uh, patterns for the Ellis Island era. Even politicians and pundits that um, are concerned about the children of immigrants today will hearken back to this earlier era and say, when immigrants came from Europe, um, when they came uh, to a manufacturing-based economy in the 1910s and 20s, uh, their children learned English rapidly, went to public school, made something of themselves and did well. And then by implication, they're concerned about ch children of immigrants today. But take a look at how similar these patterns actually are when you dig into the data. Uh, these are two different uh, cohorts of um, sons. The first on the left are sons who are living at home in the 1880 census. So this is pretty early in the age of ma mass migration period. And the second image is for boys living at home in the 1910 census who would be in the labor market um, and captured in our data in the labor market in 1940. In both eras, we see that children raised at the 25th percentile are moving up, that children of immigrants are moving up faster than children of white US born, and that particularly countries that were pointed to at the time by politicians as never being able to assimilate, the Italians, the Irish, the Portuguese, the Russians, have sons who are actually um, moving up the most rap in, uh, in the most rapid fashion. Um, so how do the children of immigrants get ahead? We know a lot more about the past than we know about today. Um, the data we're using for our historical analysis is built up from individual census records. And so we know the full gamut of census variables for these households. Our modern data is um, certainly more scarce given that it comes from the IRS records. And so all we really know about these households are their income levels. Um, so what I'm going to focus on um, I, in thinking about how the children of immigrants get ahead um, is the historical period. And what we found here is really quite interesting. Um, geography can explain almost all of the advantage that was experienced by the children of immigrants 100 years ago. Namely, immigrant families moved to the most dynamic labor markets which provided job opportunities for the parental generation, but also for the second generation who um, as well entered the manufacturing sector. Um, so immigrants, for example, avoided the US South, which was a highly rural agricultural region. And then even outside of the South, they were more likely to move to cities and more likely to move to the most dynamic of those cities. So now we can take a look at the maps that we see here on the slide. Um, these maps are from a paper by Dylan Connor, a former student of mine, um, and Michael Storper. And they reflect two different time periods. The top map is for 100 years ago. The bottom map is for today. Um, and what we're looking at is the income rank for children raised at the 25th percentile when they themselves get to adulthood. The lighter the, the shading on the map, the more rapid the upward mobility for children raised at the 25th percentile in that region. Historically, the regions that have the most rapid upward mobility are the Mid-Atlantic, what's now considered the Rust Belt part of the Midwest, um, and the coastal Pacific states. These are precisely the areas where immigrants settled. The US South, which was very dark on this shading, meaning low upward mobility, not just for Black Americans, but also for white Americans living there, um, was at the, an area with very low inflow of the foreign born. Today, the pattern is much more mixed. Many of the areas that um, have large concentrations of immigrant communities, Arizona, Florida, parts of California, are also in the darker shading. So they're also um, experiencing low upward mobility. Geography seems to matter today, but not nearly as much as it did in the past. So here's one way of taking a look at how important geography was historically. What we're looking at here is just that 1910 to 1940 cohort with the sons living at home in 1910. On the left-hand most um, 
part of the graph here, you can see the raw advantage experienced by the children of immigrants represented in rank points. So for children raised at the same point in the income distribution, children of immigrants experience six additional rank points when they get to adulthood. And now we just control for various aspects of geography. The second bar simply controls for, do you live in the South? And that explains around half of the immigrant advantage. Immigrants chose not to live in the South. And by doing so, they set themselves up and their children up for greater success. All the way on the right-hand side of the image, you can see what happens when we're controlling all the way to county fixed effects. So we're comparing two households who lived in the same county. You know, so if you think about it as the two next door neighbors, at that point, the children of immigrants no longer have um, an advantage in upward mobility. So historically, geography was the most important factor. Um, and so that can explain the pattern that we see here for the two historical time periods. The modern data, what's really intriguing is that we see a very similar pattern in aggregate, but the geography mechanism is not nearly as powerful now. So there's other factors going on in the modern period. And that's something that we really haven't nailed given the quality of our modern data and something we're hoping to do more um, to learn more about and hoping that some of you who are on the call might work on as well. So finally, um, the fourth myth um, is the idea that um, immigrants hastened to become Americans 100 years ago, um, you know, forbade speaking foreign language at home, only spoke English with their kids, moved out as quickly as they could from immigrant enclave neighborhoods, et cetera, um, and that today immigrants are slower to become American. We tried to look at this question with as many measures as we could find that we could measure both in the past and today learning English, marrying someone from another country of origin or who was born in the US, living in an integrated neighborhood. And our favorite measure, um, which are the names that immigrant parents uh, choose for their children as they spend more time in the US. In all of these cases, we found a really striking similarity between past and present. Um, and I'm reflecting um, the names measure here with this image of Vice President Harris and her sister, um, so Vice President Harris's first name is Kamala and her sister's first name is Maya. Um, and Kamala is older, born only a few years after her parents moved to the US, mom from India and dad from Jamaica. Um, and so this is a very common pattern that we see in the data that a firstborn child, a child who's born after their parents are in the US just for a year or two, will often get a name that is more foreign or ethnic in content and then as the parents spend more time in the country in the US and learn more about US culture and maybe embrace more about US culture, they shift towards less foreign sounding names. So the name Maya, for example, is a name that in the data shows up as very ethnically ambiguous. It's a name that's given both by US born parents and by foreign parents of a variety of different sending countries. So we can look at this question um, historically using census records because the full household roster is sh shows up in the census. We can see all of the children of a household and their year of birth. So we know how long their parents had lived in the US at the time the child was born. We can also um, uh, get pretty close to um, that sort of analysis by using the California birth certificate records for the modern period. We use the data to determine name foreignness. So we don't just introspect and say, oh, Kamala is a more Hindi name and Maya is a more ambiguous name, but we use the data to tell us the relative probability of a name being assigned um, by uh, people who were born in different locations. And what we find is that immigrant parents give more uh, foreign names than US born parents, but that this naming gap does close as immigrants spend more time in the country and to the same degree in the past and present. And that's really the striking part of the analysis. So let me um, conclude then um, by asking if all of the evidence looks positive, it looks optimistic, it seems like immigrants today are both economically and culturally assimilating to the same degree as they did historically. Why has it been so hard to make progress on immigration reform? This question uh, deepens and the puzzle deepens when you look at the public opinion polls 
There is a silent majority in favor of immigration in the U.S., with 75 percent of respondents on the latest Gallup poll saying that immigration is good for the country. But you can also see in the polls a real polarization opening up by a political party. So the question is going to be, what, if anything, can data and evidence and science bring to try to reduce that polarization on this topic? We take heart with a case from U.S. history where strong politicians were able to shift the national conversation on immigration right after World War II. Um, so I will end with that um, additional optimistic note of how it, it might be the case that we don't have to accept our current attitudes towards immigration as given, but they can change over time. So um, what I'm gonna show you is data that we collected from the congressional record. We would like to have public opinion polling going all the way back to 1880, but we don't have that. And so our next best proxy for attitudes and opinions towards immigration is what were politicians saying about immigration on the floor of the House and Senate. That we do have, we do have recorded. There's 8 million speeches recorded um, since 1880 uh, in Congress. We've classified them as immigration related or not. And then among the immigration related speeches, we've classified them as pro, neutral, or anti-immigration. So let me start by showing you what this pattern looks like uh, before World War II. As preface, around 40% of speeches about immigration are just neutral just sort of stating facts. So what we're graphing here is the share of speeches that are pro-immigration versus the share that are anti. Um, and so numbers like minus 40 are telling you that around 10% of speeches are pro-immigration and around 50% are anti. And that was true of both political parties and consistently over time before World War II. Statements like the one here by Sen Senator Henry Cabot Lodge um, uh, okay, hold on, I'm just checking the, sorry, I'm just checking the chat, there has been some chatter, um, are, are really so offensive that we, could, we wouldn't even hear them today um, from anti-immigrant politicians. Um, he said things like, immigrants are from races most alien to the body of the American people. And that's what we're picking up in the overall um, speeches. And now, um, we can go forward from World War II to 1965 when the border reopens. And we see that in a single generation, the way that immigrants were spoken about on the floor of Congress changed very dramatically from on average very anti to on average pro. What we know about the history of this period suggests that this was not just a grassroots change with the local electorate shifting and politicians responding, but in fact, there were concerted efforts by first President Truman and then Kennedy and Johnson to change the national conversation. Rather than thinking about immigrants as them relative to the American people who are us, instead to recast immigrants as part of the American people building the nation and contributing to the successful war effort against fascism. And then, of course, since 1965, we know that there's been dramatic polarization on the topic of immigration, and that shows up in the National Time series as well. With polarization beginning right after the 1965 Act and widening until today. So if we're going to change the conversation about immigration with evidence and facts, it's not simply going to be a matter of convincing people that immigration is good. On average, and you can see this gray line bouncing around, the average speech about immigration today is positive. So we're facing a very different challenge uh, than the SSRC faced in the 1920s when on average politicians were highly anti-immigration. We already have a set of the American people and a set of politicians who are pro-immigration today. And the question is, what are the factors that are driving this polarization? We've looked at the topics that contribute to this polarization, and we find that the two main topics uh, that contribute to the negative speeches about immigration in the Republican Party are the association between immigration and crime and the question about legality. How do immigrants enter the country, and are they doing so in legal fashion? So these days, Ron and I have been working with co-authors um, on building up a time series on immigration and crime. 
What we're finding is that there was never been a period in US history when immigrants were more likely than the US born to commit crimes. We do hope that bringing data and evidence to bear on some of these important topics and the topics that contribute to polarization will help to change the national conversation, though it's always a question how much of this conversation is driven by data and facts and how much is driven by emotion and fear. So I will end there and um, I'm looking forward to having a conversation based on your questions in, in the, the Q&A. Well, thank you so much, Leah. That was super fascinating. Um, we have uh, a bunch of questions lined up here in the, so if you don't mind, I'll, I'll throw some questions at you. Um, the first one, and I, I remember thinking about this too. Um, I think this is a great question. When you're comparing the rate of immigration across these, um, these two periods, um, well, I guess, so, so, so I'll just, I'll say the question, I have thoughts, but I'll just say the question. Um, how does the, is there any selection bias that comes in from thinking about undocumented immigrants? So if undocumented immigrants are more or less prevalent today um, relative to the past, and they're not sure you're using, I think, official census records, if they're not showing up in census records, is that um, in any way skewing your estimates of, of making those relative uh, comparisons? So our best guess at how many immigrants live in the country, both documented and undocumented, is the census. The way that we back out how many undocumented immigrants there might be, and it's always a bit of a guess, is to count up how many people arrived and declared themselves as entrants at the border, um, which you know can be through a whole variety of different visa categories and so on, um, versus how many foreign born residents show up in the census. The census does not ask a citizenship question. Of course, that's a very politically loaded uh, topic as to whether it should or should not. And it's because it does not ask a citizenship question. The idea is that every immigrant, regardless of their visa status, regardless of the, whether they're temporary or permanent resident or whether they're documented or undocumented, should show up in the census. And then we can back out how many undocumented people there are by comparing the legal entrance to the stock of foreign born. Of course, that's not fully accurate. Um, there are a lot of efforts on the part of the census to try to um, encourage participation in neighborhoods and in communities that might be under enumerated. And you know, it wouldn't be surprising uh, for us to learn that uh, immigrant communities are under enumerated for, for various reasons today. Um, but uh, you know, we have other uh, metrics that include like children who are um, enrolled in school, other touch points where we think that um, we're probably capturing something close to a population. And if there's some underestimates in the census, it's probably you know, on the order of one percentage point or something. So maybe going up from 14% to 15%. Where you see real underestimates would be if you were to count entrants at the border. Historically, you'd be getting almost everyone, and today you would be getting only a fraction. Um, and if in with that type of a time series, it would look like immigration is way down. Though of course we know that it's not. Yeah, no, that's super interesting. How we the data generating process that gets us to counts and stuff like this. Um, so here's another question: thinking about uh, tracing the economic mobility. Um, across generations. Um, obviously, with the historic census data, you're able to see occupational and I take it income status um, in the United States. And the question is, are you, are you able to take into account the um, income status um, or the socioeconomic status of the parents before they emigrated? Um, that's a great question. And uh, no, not in the big data, millions of, of records type of a, 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 an approach. But um, we ourselves and other economic historians have done this kind of work uh, for subpopulations. So we started by linking Norwegians um, from the home country in the Norwegian census to the US. Uh, and so there you can see the father's um, uh, occupational status even though the father doesn't move and it's the son who moves. So you can see from what types of families immigrants are coming from. My student Dylan, who I already mentioned once before and he gets a second shout out has done the same for Ireland. 
Um, and what people tend to find is that historically immigrants were either neutrally or negatively selected. So they were coming either from the sort of average person within their country, or they were coming from families that had low occupational status or who did not own land. Today, the opposite is true. Um, I don't know of any micro studies that have been able to link people, but I'm sure they exist and I just don't know of them. Uh, but at least from the aggregate statistics, we can see that immigrants are coming from, uh, uh, on average, uh, wealthier and more educated backgrounds today. Oops, that's really interesting. This, this is a slightly related question, although it comes from a different um, participant, asking um, if you can say something or if anybody has been able to say something about what's driving the variation across sending country in terms of rates of, um, of economic mobility, which is potentially related to, um, to the, the economic conditions that they're leaving, but also could be related to lots of other things. So we have not hazarded to do a quantitative analysis of, analysis of this. Historically, we have around 15 sending countries. Today, we have around 45. Um, so we feel a little bit leery about doing a quantitative analysis. But in the book, we uh, do dive into some of the subpopulations, um, drawing on um, some survey data that we collected, as well as from qualitative sociology. Um, and for example, when you look at the, um, the case of the Caribbean sons versus Caribbean daughters, it's incredibly fascinating. Um, the um, one thing to know is that if a child is incarcerated, they're going to show up in the data as having zero income. And so one thing that's pulling down the average for the sons of Caribbean families is they're more likely to be incarcerated than the sons of some of these other groups, and also much more likely than their own sisters. Um, and so uh, this has something to do with the way that Caribbean neighborhoods are policed, the way that African Americans or Black Americans are policed, and also the differential in parenting practices, especially in the West Indian community between sons and daughters. Daughters are really um, required to come home um, right after school to, co to contribute more within the household and sort of kept out of the neighborhood. Um, when it comes to Asian Americans, you can see that um, the children who were raised at the 25th percentile uh, from a set of Asian countries, Hong Kong, China, India, um, Pakistan, Vietnam, are doing very, very well reaching the 60th um, or 62nd, 63rd percentile. Um, some of this has to do with unmeasured uh, educational um, background of the parents. Like I said, in the IRS data, we only have income. So you could be a 25th percentile earner because you're working in a restaurant, um, you're a hotel worker, um, hospital orderly, um, child care, elder care, but from the home country, you, you arrived with a BA. Um, and from a, a number of um, respondents to our survey, we, we hear that that's actually a very common um, pathway uh, up from the 25th percentile for the children of Asian immigrants. Um, so um, I know that there are sociologists, you know, maybe even on the call or out there who've done more on this than we have, but I think with such a small number of countries and data points, we sort of felt more comfortable looking at these clusters and understanding what was going on qualitatively. All right, so here's a question near and dear to my heart, which is um, how did you, what software did you use or develop to, um, to analyze those historical census records that have the handwriting <laughs> that's um, hard to decipher even, right, even to the native eye? Okay, so first thing I should make really clear, and I, and I neglected to mention, and it's incredibly important, we did not digitize the historical census records. Those were, um, like I said, we started poking around on Ancestry. Ancestry digitized them, um, and also a sort of a parallel company, Family Search, uh, and I uh, digitized some of those as well. Um, primarily, they are digitized by volunteers from the Mormon Church, uh, Church of Latter-day Saints. So you can read more about that story and why it is that this is an important part of Mormon culture and Mormon theology um, in the book. Uh, but it came to us already with millions of observations. You know, they're not always um, completely clean. Sometimes you do one round of the work and then you have to come back and look at uh, 2.0, you know, a version that's been updated and cleaned, but um, they were not digitized by us. What we added was um, creating the algorithms to follow people over time. And that comes from, in our case, first name, last name, age, and state or country of birth. 
But we've been experimenting with adding other attributes to augment those kinds of algorithms. There's a very healthy uh, literature and debate within economic history um, and history, quantitative history as well, about um, how mm -hmm. to link people across census records. Yeah, linking, linking people across agencies and time and locations is just a, a huge frontier, right, for social behavioral science now, just like taking all of this administrative data and being able to follow people. Um, so here's um, uh, uh, a question about, um, actually several questions about, um, you mentioned that you all are thinking about um, factors that might be driving the polarization in congressional speeches about immigration. But we're getting a number of questions about what you think might be driving the, um, the increase, the, the <laughs> more positively, things that might have driven the increase in the positive attitudes towards immigrants um, before there was this polarization. And a couple of questions about, do you think that um, maybe the World War II had something to do with it? Um, and, and whether you're, you're interested in speculating about that. So at the very high level, um, I think that World War II and the Cold War played an, a very important role. Um, so right after World War II in 1947, as the Cold War is ramping up, the Soviet Union made two claims against the US um, that US claimed to be a merit meritocratic capitalist country, yet it had racist Jim Crow laws in the South and it had racist quota based immigration policies that discriminated against Poles and Italians, etc. Um, and so President Truman said, you know, we have to fix the immigration system, not because he necessarily wanted more immigrants, but because he didn't want that to be an option on the table for anti American propaganda. Um, so I think that um, historically, that's an important factor of what was going on. Um, but then, you know, we're interested also in the heterogeneity. Right now, I just showed you the overall time series, but underlying that are individual representatives. Some of those representatives were participating in the uh, move in the positive direction towards more positive attitudes. Some were not. So we are working right now with James Feigenbaum um, and with um, some of my colleagues here in political science at Princeton um, to try to understand who were the uh, representatives that sort of jumped on board with more positive attitudes and who did not. So I, I have a question of my own because I'm curious about, um, I've heard you, I, I think, um, obliquely, maybe indirectly refer to um, the quality of the data in the past and the present. Um, and if I'm, I, I, you're working with IRS data um, today, contemporary data, um, do you also, are you also working with the individual level census data today and the present in the way that you have access to the, you know, identified census data from, from the past? We are not. There are people who are in-house at Census or who have partnerships with people at Census um, who can use some linked Census data. Um, uh, and um, that's something that's available, but but very uh, like highly regulated and restricted. Um, we have verified some of the patterns that we see in the IRS data with much smaller uh, data sets like GSS um, that will ask about your own uh, economic outcomes, and then we'll ask you to recall things about your childhood, um, that sort of a thing. But, um, you know, those samples are so much smaller that it's really hard to make progress on some of the mechanisms. Um, but I think, you know, the IRS data has been linked to census. A very few set of people do have access to that. Um, and that would be something that would be very helpful in terms of understanding the mechanisms today. Do you have any views about um, our policies um, on, on data access and whether those are uh, in need of reform? Do you think that the current is because I'm in, interested in this because it almost seems like your data quality is better, right? <laughs> Under yeah. days ago and that, you know, but this is a pressing, you know, policy issue um, on which, you know, we need answers about some of the questions about kind of what's happening now to immigrants today. Do you, do you think what the set of policies is about right or do you think that we um, need to innovate? Well, it's really hard to know what the right length of time is before data becomes public. Right now in the U.S., it's 72 years before the census data becomes public. So 1950 is public now, but it's currently being digitized uh, by Ancestry and has not yet been released to researchers. Um, in some European countries, it's 100 years. 
And one thing I'm worried about is even rolling back on that. You know, I mean, I'm worried people are going to get catch wind of this and say, oh, life expectancies have gone up. We really should not um, be allowing the census data even to be released after 72 years. So I'm really worried about almost protecting what we have. Um, and that that's sort of I'm currently as an economic historian, like that's my my um, area of expertise. And I really haven't been following the modern debates. Yeah. So um, maybe uh, one more question before we, one or two more questions before we have to break. Um, and this might be related to, to data to data access. Um, uh, <laughs> some of our audience members think it's really fascinating what you've been able to do with first and second generation, and they want to know what, what do you know about third and fourth generation um, uh, immigrants? So for the modern period, we really can't say. I mean, the mm -hmm. second generation kids in the modern period were born in the early 80s. And we need that amount of time so that they can get to their late 30s, early 40s before we can capture them in the labor market. None of us, if you reflect back on what you were doing in your early 20s, want that to represent where we're going to go at the end of life. Um, and so the modern period, there's really, it's not possible. But in the historical period, yes, I've done some work on uh, first, second, third generation myself, but it was actually with slaveholders, slaveholder sons, and slaveholder grandsons. Um, that is possible, but that goes all the way back to 1860 and then forward to 1940. So I'd say for that first cohort, those 1880 immigrants, then yes, they could be linked forward. We haven't done it, but it's possible. And there's all kinds of anecdotes about like first gen works really hard, but never really, you know, uh, gets the, the income boost. Second gen um, makes it. And then third gen somehow, you know, falls off and becomes um, uh, like lazy given their generational privilege and like the income that they were raised with. So we haven't tested that, but it is something that's doable. However, only for that one cohort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then finally, last question. Um, do you or does anybody know anything about um, rates of return uh, and or factors driving return to, to the home sending country? Um, so at the very high level, um, there's been around 25-30% return rates both 100 years ago and today. Um, some of that return is at retirement, um, but a lot of that return is after only uh, three, four years in the U.S. Um, and uh, especially that was true historically, uh, that there was a strategy of come to the U.S., save up because of the um, income gap between the U.S. and the home country, go home and use that money to buy land, invest, get married. Um, and so we were able to follow this process through for one country, Norwegians, there were so many Norwegians that followed the strategy that the 1910 Norwegian census actually added a supplement about have you ever spent time in the US? What did you do when you were there? Where did you live? And when did you come back? Um, so we can see that strategy in action um, in that one context, but it really fits with what um, you know qualitatively we think we know from the history. Uh, it's interesting there, um, again, that commonality between past and present in the strategies that immigrants use. Yeah. Leah, thank you so much for joining us today for our first centennial lecture, um, celebrating 100 years of the social behavioral sciences and the Social Science Research Council. I encourage everybody to go buy your book if they haven't bought it already, go to your website and look at the papers. Um, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much, Anna. Thanks to those of you who asked questions. Um, and I see more in the chat, so hopefully I'll get a chance to look at those and feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Great. Okay. Take care, everybody. Have a good weekend and happy birthday to all of us.